We live in a Christian nation. That's what some people say. Maybe that's why they often ask, why do we need missionaries here? There are places in North America where there are very few churches. People are very open to conversation, but nine times out of 10, they have not heard of Jesus. There is no pastors, there is no people can share the gospel with them. There's lives that can be made whole with the gospel. And we're watching God change people's hearts and change people's lives. But I wish people knew how many more laborers we need in the mission field, because it's more than we can handle. Church planting is hard. We just gotta work together. We can do more together than we can do apart. We need all the help that we can get, and that's what Annie does. It allows for more laborers to come here. The Annie Armstrong Easter offering unites us all, big and little, young and old, black and white. We all give because we know that when we do, our communities will look more like this. And we all give because we know there's a name and a face on the other side of that gift. This offering, this gift that we're giving to and that everyone else is giving to, it does have a face. It's my face. This is the body. This is the body of Christ. That's what any Armstrong means to me. So you pray about what you would, uh, what the Lord would have you to give this year. Uh, we will, our church is actually going to plan a mission trip to the border on the last full week of July. I had told you that it would be uh, Sunday the 31st through the first week of August. We've backed that up a little bit. It's going to be the last week in July. I know some of you have already talked to me about the possibility of going. And the reason I bring that up is because is we're going to work directly with one of our North American uh, North American missionaries down on the border and one of the church starts that uh, that has started there. So you pray about uh, whether or not God would have you to go and also pray about giving uh, through the Annie Armstrong Easter offering this year. We want to say a word about uh, what's coming up this week. So Kevin, would you do that? I assume you're talking about the Good Friday service. I am. <laughs> I guess that's the big thing that's coming up this week, that's Friday, and starting at 5.30, we're going to have little tables out in the lobby, and we put a lot of work into that. These are going to be things where you can go and kind of experience aspects of Jesus' last few days on earth, the crown of thorns and the nails and things like that, and people will be at those different places to tell you about what those things are and what they mean. And then at 6.30, we're going to have a service in here that will be a worship service that's mostly scripture, just going through the last few days of Jesus' life until he dies on the cross. And so it's a very meaningful time, a time that's, that's very reverent and, and just really thinking, it makes you think about what the disciples would have gone through, um, not, not understanding that Jesus was going to rise again. But we know that Jesus does rise again, and we'll celebrate that on Easter Sunday, which will be two days after that. So I invite you to come to that. It's going to be, a, a, I think, a really good service this Friday, 530, and then the service actually starts at 630. All right. Thank you, Kevin. And I think we have a meeting for the workers right after church uh, in the choir room. Is that right? Do you know? Yeah. So um, for all the people that will be involved in that, we'll be meeting right after church. Uh, by the way, church council, we meet after church uh, as well because we have business meeting tonight at 6 o'clock. Hey, good to see everybody. Let's all stand to our feet. Turn to your neighbor and greet them as we continue our service this morning. We sing to the God who saves, we 
always sing to the God who always makes a way. See, hung upon that cross, and he rose up from that grave. My God, still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out to praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out to praise. Oh, we shout out to praise. Most of you already made your way back to your seats. I don't even have to tell you to go back to your seats. But if you are visiting with somebody and you want to make your way back to your seats, that would be good. And we will uh, sing this through one more time just with the chorus. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Let's sing together. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we want to be quiet. We shout out to the There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we want to be quiet. Shout out to praise, oh, we shout out to praise, oh, we shout out to praise. Amen. Would you join me in prayer at this time? Father, we praise you, we worship you, Lord, we shout out our praise to you, God, for Lord, you deserve our praise this morning. You are God. King of kings and Lord of lords. And we just want to exalt your name in everything that we do here today. I pray that Christ would be honored, that Jesus Christ would be lifted up in this place, Lord. And God, as we gather together, I know that there are some who are not with us, God, who need our prayers today. We pray for them and pray, God, that you would meet their needs where they, wherever they are. And Father, I pray for the Ukrainian people, especially this morning, God, as we see the reports, God, our heart goes out to them and we pray for their protection and pray that this war would end. Now, Father, uh, we just pray that as we worship, that, Lord, we would be able to let the things of this world fade away as we completely, totally focus on you and who you are. And Lord, if there's someone here today that doesn't know you, I pray, God, that in the power of your Holy Spirit that you would convict of sin and unrighteousness, and that they would see their need for a Savior, Jesus Christ. And we'll praise you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.
kids for doing that. Let's give them another round of applause for that. Miss June and Miss Gail and Marcia have been working with them, and uh, thank you all. You did a great job. Great time of worship. We're going to continue to worship the Lord together. We're going to sing the song that we learned last week, Glorious Day. So if you're able to, why don't you stand with us as we sing. I was buried in my shoes. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was mine too. Till I
day by day. Oh, oh, you have been good. You have been good. Let me praise your name. Oh, when all my doubts and all my fears are all that I can see, oh, and I begin to think about your strength and majesty. How can I say in your how much it changes me? would please stand for the reading from God's word. First Timothy chapter one, verses 12 through 17. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be glory, the honor and glory forever and ever. Amen.
This time we'll dismiss for Children's Church. So all our kids preschool through second grade will be going out with Miss Marcia and Miss Gail. Y'all are dismissed. Thank you, Kevin. This morning, if you would, open your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 12. John, chapter 12. Today is Palm Sunday. 
appreciate our kids uh, coming in and singing, bringing their palm branches in as well, uh, adds to the service and what it may have been a little bit like uh, back in in uh, Christ's day. But today we do celebrate Palm Sunday. We're one week away from Easter, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, on next Sunday, we'll be talking quite a bit more about that uh, historic event. The Jews know this week, Jews all around the world are getting ready to celebrate the Passover. It was no different in Christ's day. The Jews were gathering to celebrate the Passover feast. It was a week-long feast that took place and will, con- will take place uh, even around our world. Uh, I believe it's beginning on this Friday. Now, the Passover was a celebration of the time in Israel's history where they were in Egyptian captivity. And you may recall that Moses came back and addressed Pharaoh and he said that God had told him to tell Pharaoh that Pharaoh was to let his people go, let Israel go. You know, Pharaoh was stubborn and would not listen to what Moses had to say nor what God had to say. So there were nine plagues that were, um, uh, were given and carried out at different intervals, nine different plagues, and, uh, and yet through those plagues, Pharaoh still would not let the children of Israel go. And then one last plague uh, was ordered, and that was that on a given night that the death angel would pass through that area. And uh, every um, one of the firstborn children would be put to death, as well as the firstborn of all living, in other words, livestock and animals and that sort of thing. So Moses was told to tell the children of Israel that to spare their firstborn, that they had to make a sacrifice on that day, and they would take some of the blood and they would spread it on the doorpost of their home. And on that dreadful night when the death angel came through, if he saw the blood spread on the doorpost, that he would pass over their house and death would not come to that home. And thus, uh, God gave the order that they were to always remember this night. And it became a great celebration for the children of Israel, and it still is even to this day. So we're about a week away from the Passover. And Jesus is, and his disciples are getting ready to celebrate the Passover. However, they have no idea what lies ahead. Now, Jesus had been trying to warn them. He had been telling them, but it had not really been resignated. It had not been had not set in that he would in fact die that week. But they do not understand all this. The people do not understand all this. So Jesus begins to ride in to Jerusalem, and then we know the story, and we'll read about it in just a moment. The people began to lay palm branches out in front of him in clothes, and as he rode in. To Jerusalem and they declared that he was king of the Jews so each year the Jews all around the world they they celebrate this Passover but Jesus along with his disciples now they're headed to Jerusalem to celebrate this event this event and that brings us to our passage of, of scripture but before I read that uh, you know I don't think they fully quite understood what Jesus' purpose was for coming the first time. I'm sure of that. They thought that he would set up an earthly kingdom and that uh, they certainly did not see him as being one that would die. There was a lot of ideas about who Jesus was. And uh, some people um, thought he was a great prophet. He was surely a good man. He was a miracle worker. They had all kinds of ideas about who Jesus was and is. And as we begin this morning, I want you to think about that. Just who is Jesus? Who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to you? Was he a good man? Was he someone who was helpless and could not get himself off the cross? He could not avoid the cross? Was that something that was not within his power? Uh, How do you view the Son of God? Think about that as we deal with this passage this morning and In honor of reading God's Word, I would like for you to stand with me as we look at John chapter 12, beginning with verse 12. The Bible says, The next day, 
a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. Therefore the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead bore witness. For this reason the people also met him because they heard that he had done this sign. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, You see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Father, I pray that you would bless and honor the reading of your word today. Speak to our hearts. God, challenge us this morning, Lord, as we look at, Lord, who Jesus was and who he is. And God, we're just so thankful that Jesus not only died for our sins, but he rose from the dead. And God, as we approach Easter week, I pray, God, that we would truly celebrate what it is that Jesus has done for us. And Lord, we'll praise you for all that you do in this service now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You can be seated. Jesus was and is who he claimed to be. Whether you believe that or not, it does not change the fact of who Jesus was. And if you go back to the beginning of the Gospel of John, as I've mentioned in the last few Sundays, we find that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then the Bible goes on to say, in that same chapter, John chapter 1, that Jesus, the Word, became flesh and dwelt among us. So God sent His Son, Jesus Christ. He was, in fact, God in the flesh. But I want to give you four reasons or proofs that he was the Messiah using our text this morning, if you will. First of all, Jesus does the unexplainable. In other words, Jesus was a miracle worker. He did things that could not be explained. People were all struck by this man, Jesus. Such a gentleman, such love that must have just oozed from him as he got around people. They loved him. They adored him. They, they knew that there was something different about him. Yes, in fact, this man did things that were unexplainable. No one could explain it. It was the supernatural, if you will. But they wanted to see Jesus. According to verse 12, our text says, The next day a great multitude came to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So he had celebrity status, if you will. Everybody around wanted to see Jesus. Whether they liked him or not, it seems that they were gathering, they wanted to be there, they wanted to be around Jesus. Many had witnessed Jesus do the impossible. Remember, that he had just raised Lazarus from the dead. Verse 9 in chapter 12 says, Now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake, but that they might see Lazarus. Now think about that. They, they knew Jesus was going to be there, but they also knew Lazarus was going to be there. Lazarus, this man who had died and that Jesus had raised from the dead. So they came to see this miracle worker, this one who had raised one from the dead, not just somebody who had died. You might recall that he had raised other people from the dead. But in this case, Lazarus had been dead for four days. He'd been in the tomb for four days. He had been wrapped in the grave clothes. I mean, he was, as we might say today, graveyard dead. That's who Jesus was. I mean, that's who Lazarus was. And then Jesus shows up. He tells him to roll the stone away. And he commands Lazarus to come out of the tomb. And Lazarus in those grave clothes. By the way, that would have been the first zombie, I guess. He come walking out. I'm sure he was shuffling out because he would have been bound by those grave clothes. And Jesus said, loose him. 
And they began to take the clothes off of him. I often wondered, you know, what a body might smell like after four days like that. I, I, I don't know. But I think that when Jesus healed him, that he gave him perfect healing, that he was completely new, he was brand new again. But that's who Jesus was. He, listen, the, the, the Bible makes it very clear that he was a miracle worker. He did the unexplainable. And word got around quickly. Now remember... They didn't have the internet. They didn't have television airwaves. They didn't have all the marquees and billboards that we have today. But seemingly people came from near and far to see this miracle worker, the Lord Jesus. Now, for you and me, and this was really true for me, I, I, I don't know about you, but I had a hard time quite kind of understanding, you know, because we have events here. And we will publicize it. We'll put it on the on Facebook. We do all this stuff, you know, and people just kind of trickle in. I mean, we, it's hard to draw crowds today, okay? But these were throngs of people, hundreds of people, thousands of people that came to see this miracle worker. But they got the word out, and people came from all over the place. I remember several years ago, I was in uh, Lima, Peru, and just outside of Peru in the foothills of the Andes Mountains, you have to understand that these mountains were what they call desert mountains. They're, they claim that since the history of earth that it has never rained there. Can you imagine? But that's, scientists say that it has never rained there. You're talking about dust and dirt? I mean, there's nothing living in this area. But when you get up on the mountain and you look down from the mountain, you can see the dry river bottom where the occasionally water flows down through the river and there's greenery around in that in that particular area so you've got all this dirt and you've got all these people there and understand that this is third world these are poverty ridden people that are living in little huts and some of them don't have roofs on them don't rain don't need a roof right these have walls but we're up on top of this mountain and word gets out that this white man from the United States has got something to say. And literally, they're spreading the word and people are coming from everywhere. I'm up on this ridge. It's about eight or 900 foot high. I don't know. And people are coming up the mountain. Literally, just hordes of people are coming. I can see them out as far as the eye can see. People making their way. And I wait as long as I can. And then I begin to preach off the top of the mountain. And I can see down into the valley. I see the dry river bottom and all the greenery there. And as I'm preaching, it all of a sudden dawned on me that this must have been what it was like in Christ's day. When Jesus rolled into that city, he didn't take long. Word, after, word of mouth just began to spread. And people would just pour in and they poured into Jerusalem to see Jesus. They wanted to be around Jesus and see what he had to say or to see what he was going to do. Many hoped that Jesus was the Messiah. They hoped against hope that he was their Redeemer, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. They had been oppressed by the Romans. They were poor and they were living in poverty, and they were waiting on their king, and they, with great anticipation, they waited on their king, and they had heard about him, and heard about the things that he had done. Many of them had seen what he had done, and they hoped that he was the king. So we have this sense of desperation as Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. This last week, I don't know about you, but it... It moves me deeply when I see on the news what's going on in the Ukraine. And I see the, just the, this longing from the people for deliverance as they not only share some of the horror of what's going on in their nation, but they, they're begging the world for help. There are ladies who are crying on TV because their son has been killed. And there's such desperation for help. And folks, we need to pray for them. We need to pray like we've never prayed before. But 
what I'm getting at is I kind of sense that as the people gathered, there's that sense of desperation. They're looking for a Redeemer. They're looking for help. You know, we wonder many times, what can we do? What can we do even for folks who are in the Ukraine? I, I want to share something with you. You may not be able to go. There may not be much that you can do, but one thing you can do is you can pray. You can pray for the people in the Ukraine. This last week I was on my knees in my living room and I was praying and crying out to God and saying, God, please stop this. Let this war end. And it was as if God put me in the trenches with the soldiers and I began to pray, Lord, put a hedge around them. Lord, protect them. Lord, push back the enemy. Lord, destroy the enemy in this war. I tell you, we can pray. We can pray as if we're there with them arm in arm praying that God would do what no man can do. We need to pray. Pray like our life depended on it. And when we pray, remember who we're praying to. Is anything too difficult for God? Not at all. I was reading in the Scripture this week and God spoke to me through this Scripture. The Bible says, in Isaiah 40, verse 12, who has measured the waters in the hollow of His hand. That is God. Imagine the waters of the world in the hollow of God's hand. Talking about the awesomeness, the incredibleness of God. He measured heaven with a span. The span being from the tip of the thumb to the tip of your pinky finger. God can measure all of His creation with His hand, an awesome God that we worship, and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure. In a measuring, think about that. The measuring cup. That's the way it, God compared to us. That's that's who God is. Weighed the mountains and scales and His heels in the balance, folks. That's my God. He's an awesome God. He is a Creator God. He is a God that can do anything. So when we pray. We must understand who we're praying to. He's not only my Savior. He's not only my dad, my father. But there's nothing too big for God. First Samuel chapter 12, Samuel wrote, Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray. So what can we do? We can pray. We can pray. Pray like we've never prayed before. We can give. We can give of our finances and our resources. And some of you can go. We have volunteers that are going all the time back and forth to help out. It's heartbreaking when we hear about these things and we see these things. And, and I know that some of you, maybe in your life and what's going on in your life right now, you're experiencing heartbreak. There may be some experiences you've had in the past that are heartbreaking. I want to remind you of what Peter, or what we found find in 1 Peter 5, 7. The Bible says, cast your care upon Him because He cares for you. Isn't that great? I know that this awesome God that we worship, He cares for us. And folks, we see in our story this God riding into Jerusalem on a donkey and the people are worshiping Him and they're giving praise to Him. Why? Because He deserves their praise. He deserves our praise this morning. Amen? Come, Lord Jesus. Jesus is King. Look at verse 13. They took branches of palm trees and went out to meet Him and they cried out, Hosanna! Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Palm branches during this time represented triumph and victory. And oftentimes as the king rode back into the city after experiencing victory, the people would run ahead of him and they would clear the roadway of the rocks and the stones and lay stuff before him. He would come riding in on a stallion celebrating great victory. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they tell us that they spread out cloves and palm branches on the road. We see Jesus in our story riding a donkey into Jerusalem as many shouted, Hosanna. Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. They were looking for a conquering king. 
They hoped, they prayed that Jesus was that conquering king. They were thinking, though, of an earthly kingdom. They had no idea that Jesus had to die. They had no idea that he would be put to death. The verse says, that cometh in the name of the Lord. This is a partial quotation of Psalm 118.26, which is prophetic. It reads, Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Whenever we think of Jesus, do we think of a victorious king? Do we think of one who is awesome and one who is creator of all that exists? Do we view him as king? Oh, I tell you folks, Jesus did the unexplainable. He did that that science could not explain. And what was the result? The people came. They came to Him because He had done many marvelous things. They wanted to be around Him. But then secondly, Jesus fulfilled, fulfilled prophecy. Jesus was the King. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, the Bible says this, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. In the other Gospels, we learn that Jesus sent two of his disciples into a village to retrieve the donkey. Now, I don't know how you think, but in my thinking, I'm wondering, did Jesus just ask his disciples to go steal somebody's donkey? Because that's what it sounds like. But when you understand the context and in, in all that was happening here, understand that in this day, that any king could commandeer an animal. They could commandeer a horse. If they needed it, they could commandeer it. They could do it legally. And so he told them when they ask why you're getting it, let them know that your Lord has asked for it. Remember, they're already thinking, could this be the king? So it's not a far stretch to understand why that person might say, sure, take my donkey. They, they probably were honored. We don't know that. The Scripture does not say that. That's a lot of alanology now reading into it. But understand that there's a lot going on here. And besides all that, it's really irrelevant because it's prophetic that Jesus would ride in on a donkey. I don't know why God did it that way, but that's the way He did it. You know, in the Old Testament, it was written over a thousand year span of time. And folks, the main character as you read in the Old Testament is the coming Savior the Lord Jesus Christ. The Old Testament contains nearly 300 prophecies about the coming of the Messiah. And guess what? Jesus fulfilled every one of those prophecies in Himself. They all came to pass. The prophecy we see in John is just one of many. That is, that He would come riding in on a donkey. Someone said about the Bible, about what God has to say, they said the Bible is a book about Jesus. Let's never forget that. It's a book about Him. Okay? It's a book about His plan. It's a book about Jesus. It is not a self-help book. It is not a book that was given so you could be healthy, wealthy, and make a God out of yourself. That's not what the Bible is about. It was given to exalt the Savior. It was given to point us to Jesus. From Genesis 1-1 all the way through the book of Revelation, we find Jesus. We find redemption. And that is why we have the Bible today. Yes, there's a lot that we can learn from the Bible, and the Bible gives us instructions and precepts on how we're to live. But when we live the way the Bible instructs us, guess what? We're living like Jesus lived. We're becoming more and more like Him. But Jesus fulfilled prophecy. The disciples did not understand. Look at verse 16. In verse 16 it says, His disciples did not understand these things at first. Who are they? They had traveled with Him for over three and a half years. They had seen many of the miracles. They had seen Him field, field, uh, feed hordes of people. Over 5,000 men at one setting. Jesus had done many mighty miracles. But when this prophecy took place, according to John, they didn't quite get it. It didn't click with them that He had just fulfilled 
prophecy. So the disciples did not understand. They followed Jesus. They were witness to the miracles. But they did not understand. On this occasion, they missed it. They missed the fulfilling of the prophecy. You know what I find interesting about all of that? Is that they didn't understand the prophecy. And they didn't understand a lot that was happening. But they did what Jesus asked them to do. Because they trusted Him. And they followed Him. You know, we don't always understand what God's doing in our lives, do we? The question is, do we have the faith to believe? Do we have the faith to continue walking after Him and doing what He asks us to do? It, it, God doesn't ask us to understand it all. We're not going to understand it all. The Bible even asks a question of itself. Who can understand the mind of God? We cannot. And so, though we may lay out perfect plans and we think we know what God wants to do, sometimes He takes us off in a direction that we had not planned on and we wonder, what in the world is going on? Well, the disciples did that. They followed Jesus. They were faithful to Him even when they did not understand. The question this morning I ask you is this. Do we have the faith to trust Him even when we don't understand? His disciples were not perfect, but as we read here in verse 16, the Bible says, but when Jesus was glorified, what? They remembered and they knew that He had fulfilled the prophecy. When He was glorified, what is it talking about? It's talking about after the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was glorified. Then they remembered. Proof that Jesus was, is, was, and is who He says He is is because He did the unexplainable. But not only did He do the unexplainable, but He fulfilled prophecy in full. Thirdly, this morning, Jesus was celebrated. We see that in the text. The people witnessed a miracle. Many witnessed Jesus perform other miracles. But in our text, it mentions the one miracle in particular, and that is the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Now, what did the people begin to do? They began to cry out. They began to proclaim Him King of the Jews. They said, Hosanna, blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. You know what that would have meant to the religious leaders? That every one of these people were committing blasphemy against God because that's what they had already said about Jesus. They were already plotting to kill Jesus because they thought He was a blasphemer. And they were still declaring and lifting up the name of Jesus. I want you to know something. If they had been lying, if they had not seen what they claimed to have seen, they would not have been putting their lives on the line and worshiping Him at that time. As a matter of fact, we read where the, the, the religious leaders commanded that Jesus not order the people to quit worshiping Him. And what did He say to them? He says, if they do not, the rocks will cry out. And that was in another text of Scripture. But Jesus was who He said He was. The people bore witness to this fact. Verse 17, Therefore, the people who were with Him, when He called Lazarus out of his tomb and raised Him from the dead, bore witness to who Jesus was. The people met Him because of the sign. Verse 18, For this reason the people met Him because, they had, because He had done this sign. The signs, the miracles, what He was doing, the fact that He could forgive sin. All of these things were signs that Jesus was who He said He was. More and more people were being convinced that this Jesus was their King. And folks, He really was. And then lastly this morning, Jesus was a threat to Satan's kingdom. He was a threat to Satan's kingdom. This is another Another proof that He was who He says He was. Look at verse 19. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, You see, you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after Him. They were upset. Why? Because their little world was about to be turned upside down and they could not let it go. You see, they were in power. They were the ones who were honored. But now here's Jesus. Finally the Messiah has come. And even the religious leaders don't recognize it. Oh, I'll tell you, Satan was upset. He was 
disturbed deeply because Jesus had drawn this crowd of people. In Luke chapter 19, I alluded to it a while ago, the Bible says, And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd and said, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and he said, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Let me ask you a question this morning. Does God need you? Does he need me? Honestly, no. He doesn't need any of us. Do we need him? Absolutely, we need him. Hey, look, if he chose to, he could have used the material things of this world to declare him. He could have gotten the rocks to cry out. But you know what? He didn't do that. Why? He chose you, the one that he died for, the one that he went to the cross for. He chose you to speak on his behalf. You know what that says to me? It's an honor that he chose me. It's an honor that he allows me to be used by him because he didn't need a one of you. He didn't need me. But he loves us that much. And he brings us in as a part of the family of God. And we work with him in the kingdom work and reaching our world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But friend, I promise you, just as it was true on that day, it is true today when you begin to speak on behalf of the Lord Jesus. When the light of Christ shines through your life, you're going to upset Satan, something awful. And he's going to work and he will come against you and I guarantee you, he was coming against the people on this day. Satan wanted Jesus dead. And at, by the end of the week, many of these same people that were singing Hosanna to Jesus wanted him dead too. He was not happy. He wanted him dead and gone. He wanted to defeat Jesus. Satan did everything he could to disrupt God's plan. In John chapter 11, verse 53, the Bible says they plotted to put him to death. That is, the religious leaders. In fact, this Friday, when we come together, I'm always hesitant to say celebrate, but, and I'm always hesitant to call it Good Friday. But Jesus will be celebrated all around the world because he went to the cross. Because he was nailed to the cross. Because he was beaten and nailed to that cross for the sins of the world. I'm sure that Satan and all the demons of hell were singing and dancing in the street when Jesus was finally dead. But folks, Sunday came and Jesus rose from the dead. Satan had no idea he was being lured into a trap because you see it was God's plan all along that he would come and that he would die and that he would rise from the dead, that he would conquer death, hell, and the grave. And that's the promise that you and I have today, that Jesus is alive and well, and praise God, he's coming back one day. And I believe that. I trust that you do. The Bible declares that. The cross, the resurrection, would seal Satan's doom. But not only would it seal Satan's doom, but it, was, it sealed the doom of all who reject the Lord Jesus Christ. But the good news of the gospel is this. Those who put their faith and their trust in Christ, we have been redeemed. We have been liberated from Satan's clutches and we have the promise and hope of heaven. And every person in this room can have that same hope by putting their faith in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. The fact that Jesus performed miracles the fact that hundreds of prophecies were fulfilled in Him. The fact that Satan's kingdom was threatened. The fact that He was celebrated as King of the Jews. These facts are proof positive that Jesus was who He says He was. And He still is today. The question this morning is, do you know Him? And who, just who is Jesus to you? Is He your Lord and your Savior? Or is he just somebody you call on occasionally when you're in trouble? Listen, we must repent of our sins. We must put our faith and our trust in him. Jesus said, I am the way, 
the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And folks, this same Jesus, He not only died on the cross for the sins of the world, but He rose again and He is alive today. Do you believe that? He's in control. He's still on His throne. Do you know Him? Who is Jesus to you this morning? I trust that you know Him as Lord and Savior of your life. Would you bow your heads with me? Heads are bowed. Christians are praying. You may be here this morning and you've never put your trust in the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. I believe with all my heart that the Spirit of God is speaking to somebody here today who has never put their trust in Him. Or you live a good life and maybe things are going well for you, but you've never come to that place in your sight, in your, in your life where you realize that you were lost and headed to hell and you needed Jesus in your life. We want to give you an opportunity to come to Him today. Hey, look. Look around you. You see what all is going on in our world today, folks. I'm telling you, Jesus is coming again. He's coming soon. The question is, are you ready for Him when He comes? You'll never be ready for Him apart from a relationship with Him. If you ever put your faith in Christ, if you've not, we're going to pray and we're going to sing. And I'm going to ask you to come this morning. Put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Maybe this morning you just want to come and pray. Maybe you want to pray like you've never prayed before. There's things going on in your life where you see things happening in the world. and Maybe you just want to pray for the church or pray for the lost. Oh, folks, look. Let's take seriously this matter of prayer. Come before the King of kings and Lord of lords today. There's nothing too big for Him. There's nothing God can't handle. Maybe today you want to come to this altar and pray. As God speaks to your heart, would you come? Lord Jesus, thank You for being who You are. God, we love You. We worship You today. I pray, O oh God, that You'd speak to the hearts of every person in this auditorium. I pray, God, that no one would leave the same. O oh God, I pray that You would convict us, that You would challenge us, that You would change us forever. God, even when we don't understand what You're doing, I pray, God, that we'd just be obedient to do what You ask us to do. Lord, have Your way now in this invitation. In Jesus' name, Amen and Amen. Let's all stand. And as we stand, as we begin to sing, as the Spirit of God speaks, You come. Would You? Come on, right now. As we sing, You come.